Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming to this month's YBI lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Christopher W. Smith, uh, who is the director of the International Law, Narcotics Law Enforcement section here uh, at the embassy. He joined the Foreign Service in 2005 and has worked extensively on democratic reform, conflict termination, and security issues. He served at the U.S. Embassy in, in Tbilisi, Georgia from 2005 to 2007, the U.S. Consulate General in Istanbul, Turkey from 2008 to 2009, deployed as a member of General Stanley McChrystal's staff at the International Security and Assistant Force Headquarters in, Ka in Kabul, Afghanistan from 2009 to 2010, served as Deputy Political Chief at the U.S. Embassy in Nicosia, Cyprus from 2010 to 2013, and served as Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Arms Control in Washington, D.C. from 2013 to 2014. He has been here at the Embassy in Kyiv since July of 2014, providing assistance on law enforcement, criminal justice sector, and anti-corruption reforms. He speaks Russian and Turkish. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Smith. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you very much. She sort of uh, stole my introductory remarks. I was planning on introducing myself, and now I've got to jump right into my presentation. I would make a couple of quick points. Um, as you can tell, I've spent a lot of time working on uh, democratic reform issues, uh, conflict issues in parts of the world that are or have been uh, in the press, have been very high profile places to work, where things have been changing and when there have been opportunities to really get things accomplished. I, I often look for assignments based on where things are happening because I feel like uh, those are the places where you can see and seize opportunities to make a difference, to get things accomplished. And so after speaking about what we do here in Ukraine, uh, in the INL section, I would, thought I would give you all sort of four rules that I follow uh, when doing diplomacy in conflict or transition countries. But let me start quickly by um, first noting that the INL section uh, does different things in different parts of the world. Uh, you'll notice it's the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement section. Basically what we do is civilian security sector reform based out of the State Department. INL is the name of the office here and we are the representative office of a bureau that is part of the State Department. Effectively, we fall in between what USAID does, and I don't know if you've already had a speaker from USAID. They're sort of the traditional assistance office that people think of from the United States government. Uh, and then you have the military, which does military to military assistance. We kind of cover everything in between. USAID can't work with law enforcement agencies just as the military doesn't traditionally work with law enforcement agencies. That's really our domain. So uh, in INL here in Ukraine, we divide our activities between two key sectors. Sector one is law enforcement reform and operational effectiveness. And sector two is criminal justice sector reform and everybody's favorite topic, anti-corruption. So we cover these issues uh, in Ukraine uh, using what I like to think of as kind of the meeting point between policy and assistance. So we are players in developing U.S. government policy on issues in Ukraine dealing with law enforcement, anti-corruption, justice sector issues. But uh, unlike the political section, we also have money to then try to do things to solve problems in these sections. And I know that well because I am a political officer myself by training in the Foreign Service and have served in a, as a political officer in Georgia, uh, as was mentioned before, and Nicosia as well in Cyprus. So um, what does all of that mean, really? Primarily, we work with entities in the government, whether it's the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the border guards uh, on the law enforcement side of the house, um, the SBU, the security service of Ukraine, 
on the law enforcement side of the house. We work with the Ministry of Justice on the justice side. We work with the Prosecutor General's office. Uh, and we increasingly are working with civil society organizations, NGOs, as we continue to expand our programming here in Ukraine. One thing I would say is that, like many offices in this embassy, after the Maidan revolution, things really changed for my office. During the Yanukovych regime, it was not the best place to be working on reform. I'm sure you all would agree, particularly in the areas where we work, which are often very sensitive, very security focused, and often, uh, as in with uh, the Yanukovych regime, areas where the government is not interested in making huge changes. Following the revolution, following the election of a new government, that has changed radically. We feel that we now have a strategic partnership with several different areas of your government to accomplish critical reforms that relate not only to the demands of the Maidan, but also relate to Ukraine's growing integration into the Euro-Atlantic sphere. And I'll talk about some of the programs that we're working on uh, just now. On the law enforcement side of the House, our biggest project is something that I'm sure all of you have heard of, is the patrol police reform. This is a reform designed to um, disband the DAI, the traffic police, and replace them with a police force that is modeled on Western policing practices, primarily the ethos of protect and serve. This would be a first responder force that people in Ukraine can be proud of, can embrace, and the ministry's uh, motto for this police force actually is Maya Novai Palizia, my police, my new police force, because this is about creating a police force that's answerable to the people, that's designed to protect and serve the people, and our hope is by protecting and serving the people, the people will protect this force as well. This is a major project that our uh, office is partnering with the ministry uh, in developing. And interestingly enough, the deputy minister who is in charge of this uh, reform, uh, of bringing it to life, is Deputy Minister Ekas Guladze, which uh, I don't know if any of you know her, but you might have seen her on television. And I know her from my first assignment in Tbilisi when she was the first deputy minister of internal affairs in Georgia. And actually, we worked together on some issues there. So it shows you, really, it's a small world sometimes when you end up working with somebody in one government, in one country, and then all of a sudden you're working with them again. Um, so the patrol police project is sort of our big reform effort with the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The other law enforcement agency that we have had a long and fruitful partnership with are the Border Guards, the State Border Guard Service of Ukraine. My office has been working with the Border Guards over the last 10 years or so, helping them reform from basically a Soviet arm of the KGB into a Western model law enforcement institution. This has probably been our biggest success for the INL program in the last 12 years that we've been here. Uh, and I think the border guards certainly also regard our cooperation as having been very fruitful in helping them professionalize their service and adopt many of the guidelines and practices that are common in countries uh, to the west of Ukraine, in Poland, Hungary, et cetera. Now, of course, the border guards, uh, after the emergence of the conflict in the east, were facing a very different type of challenge than what we had focused on over the last 10 years. Suddenly, questions of professionalization or standardization with Western Europe didn't really occupy as much of their time when they are being rocketed and shelled and attacked all across the eastern border of Ukraine. They're our partners. So we appreciate the fact that they needed our help. So INL responded by providing them with $10 million in assistance, which includes 2,300 sets 
of U.S. Level 3 body armor and protective gear for the border guards and rapid reaction forces who are operating in the east and south of Ukraine, 35 armored vehicles which are protecting border guard lives as we speak. In fact, Deputy Chief of the Border Guard Servitsuk sent me an email uh, two weeks ago where he showed a picture of two of our vehicles which on February 5th were totally destroyed outside of Mariupol in a Grad rocket attack. And he sent me the pictures of the vehicles were completely destroyed. But all six of the border guards that were in those vehicles are alive and still doing their jobs in the East. That is the type of assistance that they needed from us, and that is what we responded in providing. Uh, and in addition to those uh, items, we also provided them with 70 thermal imagers, uh, which are devices you can use to identify somebody in the dark uh, by imaging their thermal heat, the, the thermal image that comes off of their body temperature. So our newest project with the Border Guards is to try to build on that initial response in cooperation and try to take things to the next level. The Border Guards face a challenge that is not stationary. The counterterrorism, the law enforcement, the complex criminal elements that are operating throughout Ukraine's borders are now much more mobile than they were in the past. And given the conflict in the East, maintaining control over the border is proving more and more difficult. So we're trying to work with the border guards now to train and organize and equip new rapid reaction forces that can be mobile and have the tactical capabilities to meet these challenges. This is a big project that we are working on with them now. Um, so that basically covers the big picture of the issues we're working on on the law enforcement side of the house. Now, of course, we're also trying to be helpful as the government does bigger legislative initiatives to reform the entire civilian security sector. But these are the projects, the ones I've just described, these are the projects that I think have an immediate operational impact in Ukrainians' daily lives. On the justice side of the house, we are and have been working with the Ministry of Justice for some time to stand up and implement the Free Legal Aid Program. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but this program provides free legal assistance to Ukrainians who cannot afford a lawyer to defend them in cases where they are uh, involved in the criminal courts. We've been working with the uh, Ministry of Justice on this program and also with civil society actors who support this for some time, and we hope to expand that cooperation in the future. Uh, additionally, there have been some changes in the Prosecutor General's office recently uh, that have motivated a new focus on reform in that institution as well. When you look at the uh, statistics in public service uh, surveys, many people often cite the Prosecutor General's Office as being the most corrupt institution in Ukraine. So trying to reform this institution is going to be a very difficult challenge, but the government is committed to it, and we are working closely to try to help them implement the Procuracy Reform Law, which was passed by the last parliament, which basically forces the Prosecutor General's Office to downsize significantly from a very large institution into one that's perhaps more manageable. So we'll be working to try to support uh, efforts to do these things and to improve their internal processes, their case management processes. Uh, one of the benefits that our office can provide is bringing in experts who don't just provide advice. Yeah, you'll get a lot of advice in Ukraine. There are a lot of people running around providing advice. Our experts will come in and partner with these ministries to draft new guidelines, to develop new strategies, to roll up their sleeves and actually do the hard work of setting up these new mechanisms and implementing these new reforms uh, that the government has charted for itself. Uh, additionally, in the justice sector side of the house, we have the anti-corruption piece. One of the areas that we are focused on is trying to help this new entity called the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, which is an investigative body that was created in legislation from the last parliament to set up an independent investigative body that is focused on 
investigating high-level public sector corruption. In other words, targeting the high-level corrupt actors in the government, in the civil service, that are using their positions of power in order to enrich themselves illegally. This, uh, although this body was created in law, it effectively has to be created from scratch. In other words, created from nothing. It doesn't exist at this point. The first step is to uh, elect a director, and there's a selection commission now considering candidates for that position. Uh, but that director will immediately be under tremendous pressure to deliver investigations that Ukrainians have been understandably waiting for for a year. He will have to, he or she will have to deliver very high profile and very public results in a short period of time. So in order to do that, we've been working with partners in the government, in civil society, in the parliament, to try to come to an agreement on what are the minimum necessary operating requirements so that once NABU launches, they can immediately start in on their very important work. All right, on those notes, I mean, that's effectively what we're focused on in Ukraine. This is what we are uh, planning to do. And now let me talk about what we bring to the table. Tomorrow, our ambassador will sign with Minister Avakov, the Minister of Internal Affairs, who is representing the government of Ukraine, a new agreement through which our office will execute more than $26 million to support these types of projects. This is a significant new uplift in funds. This is a significant increase in funds for our office. But it's also a demonstration of the fact that we believe in the partnerships we've developed with these ministries, with these officials, and of course with the civil society actors with whom we've had a partnership in the past and hope to grow that partnership in the future. So I'm very optimistic, actually. You know, it, I often end up talking with uh, Ukrainian contacts and, and colleagues, and, uh, and people tend to you know, demand a lot. They want to see action. They want to say, what has the government actually done? You know, what is it that I can point to to say, this is a real reform that they've carried forward? And it's tough. I've done this in Georgia. I've done this in Afghanistan, in other countries. And it's very difficult to deliver concrete examples of reform successes. But our hope is that the patrol reform is a good example of something that we can demonstrate to people that this government can take reforms that have an immediate impact, an immediate improvement in people's lives. And that's important for two reasons. One, it's important because you have to be responsive to your voters. Yeah? Ultimately, the people of Ukraine elected a parliament and a president that are very, very focused on reform. They have significant expectations, and understandably so. So if you can demonstrate that you can make a difference in people's lives, this will motivate Ukrainians also to support the government, to take the necessary measures to continue that progress. But also, it's important for the government itself. Confidence and belief is very important in these situations. It's very important to believe that all the hard work, you know, the people in your government are working 24 hours a day in many cases, seven days a week, to try to change things. There are a lot of people with whom I work that basically live in their offices as they scramble to try to do something. They want to use this opportunity to really deliver a new future for this country, as do we. But it's important for anybody who's working on something to have some success that you yourself can point to, that you yourself can also be proud of, and that can create the momentum within the bureaucracy, create the change in behavior necessary to demonstrate to the bureaucracy itself that this is indeed a new day. These are indeed new goals, and we are indeed taking new measures to achieve them. So on that note, uh, given my experience working on these issues here in Ukraine and in other parts of the world, I thought I might give you a couple of the rules that, as a diplomat, I tend to follow. I assume that some of you maybe are interested in joining the Foreign Service of Ukraine at some point, so I thought I would uh, give you some of my rules for operating in countries where there is a real opportunity for reform, in transition countries, in conflict countries. And the first rule is 
Proceed until apprehended. Don't wait for anybody to tell you what to do. In these crisis situations, you will often be sitting in a room of very senior people, and everyone is just waiting for someone to say, well, we could do this and start doing it. Nobody's waiting for a perfect plan. In these situations, it is not the perfect strategy that gets you to the objective 20 years from now. No, you're in a situation where you are trying to meet objectives that are 20 days away. Again, getting back to that point I made before of creating the critical momentum for reform, delivering progress step by step that creates that momentum and, in, and eventually has you making demonstrable change in the society or situation you're working in. A lot of people in a crisis situation, it's natural human behavior, will stop and start to worry, well, maybe we should do this or maybe we should do that. And they have a great phrase in English, which is, you can't roll up your sleeves if you're wringing your hands. Yeah? If you're worried about things, you're not going to get down to business, which is what you really need to do. And anybody working in these situations, the people who succeed in these situations, are the ones who start doing something rather than talking about it. Okay, that's rule number one. Rule number two, which is a corollary to this. Although it's important to do something, don't mistake activity for progress. Yeah? In these situations, I can remember, for example, when I was in Afghanistan, working in the military headquarters, a genuine emergency situation for everybody who was working there. Everybody's busy. Everybody's running around and doing things. Yeah, nobody has any time. They're all clearly doing things. And I remember my general said to me one time, when I was listing off all the different meetings we had set up, all the things we were, we were doing, he said, OK, well, what are any of those meetings actually produced? You know, don't mistake activity for progress. It's not enough just to be busy. You have to be busy moving towards an objective. You have to be doing things that are delivering outcomes. Maybe they're small outcomes. Maybe the scope of expectations is limited given the situation you're in. But always make sure that the work you're doing is delivering something that you can see, that you can touch and feel, that you can explain to others. And that leads us to the third rule, which is understand the strategic context. It's not enough for me to be busy working on the patrol police reform. I know it's important. My counterparts know it's important. But does my boss, the ambassador, know how important it is? Not if I can't explain it to him in the strategic context. Do people in Washington, does the president of Ukraine, the prime minister of Ukraine, do they know why this is important? Not necessarily. Something very small that to you, because you're working on it, seems very important, might mean very little to the people making decisions if you can't put it in the strategic context. You need to understand what are the strategic issues at play in the country that you're working in, on the issues that you are focused on, and make sure that you and what you are doing is plugged in and advancing those strategic objectives. This is critical, because otherwise, all you're doing is moving your ball forward but you're not connected to any larger game. This is a very common challenge, because everybody gets busy. You're worked on the details of what you're focused on. To you, it seems critical. To you, it seems important. But to everybody above you, they don't understand what you're doing, because you're not plugged in to the strategic context. OK, and then finally, the last rule that I always follow when choosing where I'm going to go and what I'm going to work on is three key criteria. People, purpose, pay. This is how I make decisions. If the first one is not there, if I don't have the right people working on something, if I don't have the right counterparts to work on any issue, and I don't care how important it is, I'm not interested. Because without the right people, you cannot get things done. People are the most important commodity in any crisis or transition situation. No matter what the purpose, it can be the most noble purpose on Earth. But if you don't have the right teammates 
If you don't have the right interlocutors, where are you going to go with this issue? Nowhere. For me, that has a particular resonance. I just mentioned we are going to basically provide $26 million in assistance. That's $26 million from US taxpayers, people that I'm responsible to. So any project that I'm going to put US taxpayer money into, I want to know that my counterpart in the government is the right person, or my counterpart in civil society is the right person, someone I can work with, someone I can trust, someone who is going to own this issue. I don't want to be the one owning this issue. This assistance isn't for the United States. This assistance is for Ukraine. So if you're in a situation where you have a really great idea and your counterpart from the host country doesn't really think of it the same way or doesn't really own the issue, then you're going to be wanting it more than they do. This is another critical rule, which I should probably add to my list, is you know, don't get ahead of your partner government, whether it's in Ukraine or Georgia. Don't be pushing people. You know, pushing people down the road is OK. Don't be pulling them, because then you're ahead of them. Yeah? You're doing it for you. You can't want it more than they want it. Yeah? Pushing is OK, I think. Pushing a little bit is all right, because they're still in front of you. Yeah? But pulling is not going to work. You end up doing all the work, and when it's finished, it will accomplish nothing, because the people who need to own it won't own it. So again, people, purpose. For me, I want to make sure that I'm working on things that matter. Every country that I have served in, US national security interests have been vital in those areas. When I worked in Georgia in the immediate aftermath of the Rose Revolution, I was inspired by the opportunity to support a democratic transformation in a country which in 2004, 2003 was basically a failed state. Look at Georgia now, very impressive country. And a lot of that success, a lot of that credit goes to the reformers who tried to build something new from a very difficult situation. And I don't just mean people in the government, I mean civil society, opposition, everybody played a role in this. So purpose, purpose is important. I went to Afghanistan. I was living in Istanbul, working as a consular officer. Istanbul is one of the nicest cities in the world. It was great, right? I was having a great time. Why go to Afghanistan? Because I believed in the mission. And even more importantly, I knew General McChrystal was the right person, right? So the opportunity to work for him on an issue that I cared about made the difference. That's how I made the decision. And then pay, it's probably more important for businessmen than it is for me, because I get paid the same no matter where I go. But anyway, PPP sounds nice, right? It's per people purpose pay. So ultimately, whether you're in business, whether you're in diplomacy, uh, whatever your field of business, for me, these are the three criteria that I make decisions on. And I came to Ukraine. I got this assignment in 2012, long before Maidan, long before any other changes, I was still working in Washington. But I was asked to come out here by the previous ambassador, Ambassador John Teft, who was my ambassador in Georgia. And he's now in Moscow, doing hard work. Uh, he was like a mentor to me. And I asked him, sir, what do you think about this position? He said, absolutely. Come to Ukraine. This is the place to be. This is the place to work. Again, the people, right? and the purpose. All right, nothing's more boring than listening to somebody just drone on and on about their rules and their job and their experiences. So why don't we transition here and, and, and open it up for some question and answer. I was merciful to you. I didn't talk too long. But the deal has to be, if I don't talk too long, then you guys have to ask good questions. So I'll open it up. Anything, you can ask me about what we do here in Ukraine. I've talked about a lot of different things. You can ask me about my previous assignments in Afghanistan, Georgia, Cyprus, Turkey, uh, diplomacy, my rules that I shared, anything. Floor is open. Brave soul in the back. Yes. Uh, how long are you going to work here? Good question. I got here in July, and normally this would be a two-year assignment. 
but I have extended for a third year, so I'll be here until 2017. Again, we have the right people and the right purpose here for me. So it was easy decision to extend for another year. Please. Okay, so what then? What after these three years? Where are Good you question. Going? Good question. Well, uh, hmm. I have my views and my wife has her views about where we should go <laughs> after this. Uh, it's difficult to say, you know. Um, when you're engaged in something like this, you know, again, as I tried to highlight in my presentation, and I hope it came through, our section is working on policies and issues that are at the center of the war for reform in Ukraine and also play a, a role in the war in the East. So we're very focused. We're working, you know, very long hours. It's hard for me to think about what happens beyond 2017. But I, to be honest, would like to go somewhere totally different than where I've served. You know, all the countries that I've been in have kind of been close by, except for Afghanistan is a ways away, but all of these countries have been close by, so I think I would like to go to Asia or South America or somewhere totally different. It's a good question. My wife would definitely like to go to Japan or Korea or something like that, so we'll see. When I think Asia, though, I think like Vietnam, I think the countries where, you know, Things are happening, things are changing, although Japan and Korea are also very, very interesting. Russia, hmm. <laughs> uh, not yet. Not yet. Please. I want to say about anti-corruption program. Yeah. What is basic principle in your assistance? And yeah. So our... It's a difficult field to work in right now. In a sense, anti-corruption touches everything that we do. You know, creating a new patrol police force is about creating a patrol police force that's not corrupt, right? The biggest complaint that I hear about the Dai is that they are corrupt. And everybody has the same, there's nobody who said to me, oh, the Dai, why do you want to dis, you know, why does the government want to disband the Dai? Everybody gets it. Yeah, okay, got it. Create a new force that isn't corrupt. And I should say that some of the applicants for this new patrol police force are former DAI officers. You know, that's open to them. If they can get through the competition and then go through training like all the other recruits, there's no reason why they can't be. Um, with respect to the anti-corruption efforts that we have with the new National Anti-Corruption Bureau, our initial focus is going to be providing experts and administrative staff, and I mean Ukrainian experts, I don't mean necessarily American experts, maybe some American experts too, experts from other countries that have done similar projects like standing up a bureau like this, um, will want to provide that sort of assistance. But really, you know, now I think about it with the Prosecutor General's Office, another area where corruption is a major challenge, you know, in supporting the reforms that we're working on with the new Deputy Prosecutor General is also about anti-corruption. It's about ridding corruption from the system and creating a process that works for Ukrainians, that works for the average person. Um, but it's a major challenge. You know, I mean, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk is absolutely right. Ukraine faces two existential threats. One is external from Russia, and one is internal, which is corruption. And the external one uses the internal one to complete its objectives, right? So my hope is, by fighting the internal one, you can also help to deal with the external threats. And I think the government sees it the same way. But it's a major challenge. Look, Ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. No question about it. But these things can be done. These changes can be made. I mean, this is one of the fundamental points that I make in all my interactions with members of your government, with civil society, with average citizens. I've been in countries where these things have changed. Georgia changed fundamentally. Georgia was more corrupt than Ukraine is when I got there and changed within two years dramatically toward the positive. Good question. Yes? We have a few questions from our online audience. So the first one is, um, is it presumed that unless a sense of moral justice is restored in society and in law enforcement, effective and prompt changes are in doubt? 
I think that justice matters. And in a sense, emotions matter. Oftentimes, it's the perception of justice. It's the perception of moral right. It's the emotion that things are moving in the right direction, or this is a good idea, or this is a bad idea. Oftentimes, emotions matter even more in crisis situations, the perception that the government is doing things. You can sit down on a piece of paper and list all the things that your government has accomplished in the last year. But the perception, the emotion about what the government has accomplished might be different, right? So seizing the moral initiative, seizing that emotional response and trying to persuade people, and it's a difficult thing to do because some people are persuaded by some things, some people aren't, but creating, again, that momentum, that perception of change is vital towards getting people to believe in these reforms, to believe that these changes are possible. And I don't know how you feel, but even in the last couple of months, I do get a sense that things are changing a little bit. The perceptions, I think, are more positive than they were when I first got here. But it's a, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So yes, the response is, it's, it's very important. Yes. Chris, how do you plan to involve a new blood to your team of reformers? Great question. Great question. Uh, I think, well, let me use the patrol police as an example. So for the patrol police, which will be somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 strong in Kyiv, how many applicants do you think we got? How many applications do you think? Ukrainians either volunteer, you know, online applications or coming into the recruitment center and volunteering? How many? Oh, you must have read the press reports. You're stealing my thunder here. Well done. 35,000, yeah? The vast majority of them, and I mean like 90%, have no relationship to the security services, have no relationship to the police. Many of them were on the Maidan, Many of them are people who believe in reform, who want to see a different future. Overwhelmingly, they are younger people in their 20s. And I've been to the selection commissions where they're interviewing these applicants, and I've talked with them about what it is that they want to do. And the responses are very patriotic. You know, they're people who are talking about, I have a desire to change my country. This is something I think that can work. There is positive momentum behind this reform, and it's attracting these reformers. So this is one measure, you know, reaching out to them. Another thing that we're trying to do in my office, which traditionally works almost exclusively with the government, is we're trying to expand our connections to civil society. We're starting a grants program where small, medium, large grants, where we can try to energize and try to create relationships with civil society organizations who already work effectively on anti-corruption or law enforcement reform or access to justice. We want to have a grants program where they can come to us with an idea and we can give them some seed money to start their work or where we can go to them for their expertise to help us. For example, great, you stand up this patrol police force, but who's watching them? Okay, you have internal affairs unit in the patrol, they're watching themselves, but who's watching the watchers, yeah? Really, only civil society can do that. And so we're trying to reach out to these young reformers, this young blood, uh, to, to, to bring it into uh, our efforts and really improve and magnify our ability to do what we've set ourselves to do. Good question. Please. Yeah. I have a question. So, uh, for example, you have a passion to do a project, right? You are in Ukraine, for example. But then your term goes out, and you need yeah. to go out to another country or something. But you have, you still have this passion. You have an idea how to do reforms and etc. And uh, the new government or some somebody else uh, up there appoints another person for this position. Mm -hmm. But he or she is not as passionate about it as you. And you still have a, those ideas, and you. You, you, will, you will be able to work, uh, I don't know, abroad uh, to live this project, but you still have some sort of um, thoughts and ideas how to improve them. What, what's going on with the project? 
uh, will it fail or something? Yeah, well, that's, that's important. I mean, none of these projects that we work on only depend on one person. But nevertheless, you're absolutely right. As I said from the beginning, people matter. It's important to get the right people in the right place. I can tell you, trust me, that the number of people applying to take my job or any job in this embassy working in Ukraine is very, very high. We get very good applicants from within the Foreign Service to come to Ukraine. Why? Because what's happening here matters. Matters to Ukrainians, matters to Europe, matters to the United States. People want to help because they see this not just as a battle for reform in one country or a geostrategic struggle based in one country. No, this has regional, this has global implications. So you get a lot of people who want to work on these issues. But yes, this is one of the challenges of the Foreign Service. Um, you end up working on something, pouring your heart and soul into it, and then you move on to do something totally different. Uh, but it's also, I think, one of the strengths of the Foreign Service because, you know, uh, you work on something for two years, three years, uh, sometimes having somebody else come in and look at it with a different perspective can be a really good thing. You know, I have my views. I'm an opinionated person, yes? So maybe it's important also after a couple of years for somebody with a different approach. Circumstances change. Ukraine will not always be in a crisis, yeah? Most of my career I've spent in crisis situations. Uh, and it's important to have the right people with the right skills and experience doing jobs. But that said, things change here. Things will get better. And, uh, and perhaps you'll need people who can look at these types of things with a longer term perspective than I have, given the nature of the situation that we're in right now. But yeah, it's, it's often difficult to leave these countries and leave these projects. But they won't fail. That's because they're owned not by my office. They're not owned by the people in, in the embassy who are working on these things. We work on projects that our counterparts own and will continue even if we're not there. Very good question, though. Yes? My question is about uh, challenges. What challenges did you face um, during your work in Georgia and Afghanistan during these re reforms? And just in general as a diplomat, so what, uh, what would you say um, uh, maybe recommend us uh, uh, what should we like, uh, expect from this profession of diplomat as well and what challenges uh, we can face and uh, how to act in, in this crisis situation. Yes, um, Georgia, I would say, the big difference between Georgia and Ukraine is that Georgia was hard. Make no mistake, I mean, doing these things was very hard. But Ukraine is complicated. Yeah, Georgia was relatively simple situation. Ukraine is a much more complicated problem, in my opinion. Um, so there are different skills, there are different um, approaches that you have to have to a complicated problem than just a difficult problem. Um, with respect to working in crises, you know, one of the challenges is um, trying to make sure, and I talked about this before, about the strategic context, trying to make sure that as you're, as my father would say, as you're trying to shoot the closest snake, yeah, you have all these snakes coming towards you, make, you're trying to shoot the closest one so you don't like a video game, so you don't get bitten or something, right? Trying to, at the same time, keep your eye on your longer term objective, on what it is you're trying to accomplish, is very difficult. And I remember my very first boss in the Foreign Service in Georgia, she said to me, look, we're going to be working crazy hours. It's going to be very busy every day. There are so many different demands coming in. You have to figure out some way to keep your eye on what your objectives are. And her recommendation was, at the beginning, every six months or every year, sit down and think, what are the three things I want to accomplish? What are the three big things I want to accomplish? And what are three steps I need to take for each one of those in order to accomplish it? And it sounds silly, right? In the sense, three and three, OK, you know doesn't sound that big a deal. But when you're in a crisis situation, having a view towards the three objectives that you have and being able to look down at this piece of paper and think, OK, am I actually making any progress towards this? Again, am I just all activity and no progress towards an objective is really critical. I think this is probably the most fundamental. So on one hand, my advice to you is kind of, um, kind of contradictory. Because on one hand, I'm saying just do something. Something has to be done. 
But at the same time, you have to have at least some semblance of a plan. You have to know what the three things you're trying to do are and make sure that you're always making progress. You know, I don't know if you ever have uh, sailed in a sailboat, for example, or been in a boat. You're going along, the waves are crashing, you know, you're trying to deal with every wave that's rolling in, but you still also have to keep your eye on the shore. You know, where is it you're trying to go? You still have to have your compass and figure out what the ultimate direction is. Good question. Please. You told us a lot about police patrol reform, but what is uh, actually the role you're playing in this reform? And uh, what's good. the critical action? Very good question. I actually agree. Thank you, thank you. I should have made that clear. Uh, so our role is really twofold. One, it's, you know, I, I describe this as a Western model patrol police force. So we've brought in experts from other countries, from the United States, from Ukraine, to help create a project team to get this reform off the ground in support of the deputy minister, and the minister's vision for this reform. So expertise is one thing. More fundamentally, it's bringing top quality US police officers here to Ukraine to train the MOI folks involved in this reform. So to train the Ministry of Internal Affairs instructors who will then train these new patrol police recruits on US patrol police tactics. You know, how to get to know your community, how to safely stop a vehicle, how to identify if somebody's a threat or not. You know, all of these different things are, are I'm not a law enforcement person myself, I'm a diplomat. So we have to reach back to our relationships in the United States, and we had a wonderful team come from Reno, Nevada, who are, are really experts in not only policing, but also in that adult education techniques, those training techniques to break through to the Ukrainian trainers. And then our trainers will also participate in the actual training of the recruits. So they will train the instructors from the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Those instructors will then train the recruits together with our police officers. So that it's a Ukraine context that's being trained, but our experts are there too to offer their views, offer their advice offer their example. So those are two examples. Yes? Um, nowadays we have uh, a lot of observations about the part that the Ukraine should follow, and a lot of people uh, talk uh, that this part would be like in Georgia. And you have been uh, working in Georgia for a long time. Yes. And I would like to ask you about such question. What are the main differences between people and the civil society in Georgia and Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Because they had a rose revolution and they changed their country. Yes. They caught that chance without any blood. And we had any my dance without any result. Yes, yes. Um, the differences are vast. I mean, just to begin with, Georgia is a very small country of about 5 million people. Ukraine is a major country of uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million people. Uh, this is a much bigger country. The infrastructure, the institutions are much bigger. If you think about assistance money to support projects, everything costs 10 times as much to do it in Ukraine, just by the scale of the bureaucracy, the scale of the nation itself. Uh, the fact that you are fighting an existential threat to your independence adds another dynamic. There. But I would argue that, as we discussed before, this war for reform, this war for anti-corruption, this war for a new future will only, I think, improve your capabilities to defend against that external threat. But this is something, while the Georgians definitely had territories occupied, there was not an active, large-scale conflict going on when I was there. One emerged later. I was there from 2005 to 2007. But this is a fundamental difference. Um, I think another difference is that when the Saakashvili government came to power, they essentially dominated the government. I mean, his party had a vast constitutional majority in parliament. It was easier for them to make uh, radical decisions because the balance of power was not the same as it is here in Ukraine. Uh, 
this is uh, useful if you want to take sharp measures, if you want to do radical things. This is important. Uh, at the same time, a lot of people have argued that because there wasn't a balance of power, uh, some of those measures were not taken with as much forethought as would have been taken were there a more robust opposition at that time. I, uh, I have my own view on that, and I'll keep it to myself. With respect to Ukraine, you know, on one hand, you have a coalition that supports reform, and it's actually quite a vast ownership of parliament in terms of the numbers of seats. Yet you have, I think, sometimes competing ideas about how to get things done, which is not bad. I mean, that's what democracy is all about, right? Compromise tends to be the method that delivers the best long-term solutions for problems. But it's also, I think, slowed things down sometimes, uh, which is also a fundamental piece of democracy. Uh, but I think it underpins, perhaps, where some Ukrainians would have liked to see more radical changes taken immediately. Um, this sort of balance of power has prevented that. But one could also argue that that balance of power can ensure that these reforms will be longer lasting and won't necessarily face problems down the road. This is a fundamental difference as well. Good question. Yes. And I would, if I could, I'm sorry, just to finish that off. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to talk to um, Deputy Minister Zguladze, who was first Deputy Minister in Georgia, about this issue. And she and I talk about it from time to time. And it's, um, you know, this is just a very different context. And she really appreciates that and articulates it well. She understands that Ukraine is a very different situation. Ukraine in 2015 is very different than Georgia in 2005. A lot of time has passed as well, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see these experts who definitely have a, a, a history of accomplishing great things, but they also understand what mistakes they might have made in the past. And they've learned from those mistakes, so they're not being replicated here. This is really, I think, an additional value to having these technocrats, whether they're from Georgia or from Lithuania or other countries, to having their, their experience, not so much that they just want to replicate the model that they used in the other, but rather that they know the nuts and bolts of what's needed to make it work, but more importantly, they know what mistakes they shouldn't make the second time around. You know, it's interesting. My brother is a businessman. And he told me one time that it's easier to get a loan from a bank if you've had a business in the past and that business failed than if you've never had a business before, which shocked me, you know, to think about. But actually, when you think about it, it makes sense because the bank thinks, all right, at least he's not going to make that mistake again, right? At least he's learned this amount of, you know, he's got this amount of experience. That's, he's not going to replicate the same thing, one hopes. Thank you. Be familiar to the previous one. So, uh, during your work during this period of three years, have you noticed any fundamental changes in the uh, way people in Ukraine behave? They treat each other. They um, form their attitude towards the government. I mean, especially those changes which can, in perspective, lead us to the real civil society. Mm -hmm. I've been here for seven months. I'll be here for three years. Oh. But in seven months, uh, it has been interesting to see, and I, I'm not an expert on Ukraine, I've never been here before, uh, but I must say that this is an extremely patriotic country, and that's always, you know, I come from a very patriotic country too, and I'm very warmed by that, you know, to see people taking measures, you know, I went, we went to the circus with my kids, yeah, and even in the circus, you know, they had the flags and they had this patriotic, I, I'm inspired by that because it's important, it's critical. Unity is critical to facing the challenges that you all face now, which, make no mistake, are existential. And, uh, and, and I, so I'm not in a position to comment what things were like in the past, but I must say that, you know, particularly meeting people from your generation, I'm always inspired. You know, meeting these patrol police recruits uh, who really want to change things in their countries, you know, that makes a difference. That inspires, I think, um, uh, that bodes well, not just for these immediate challenges that you face right now, but for the long-term health and prosperity of your country. Thank you. Basically, it's all on your shoulders. You know, I mean, if you think about it, you're really the ones who are going to make this work or not. 
a lot of the work and decisions are being made, you know, by people who are older than you right now, but you're really the ones who are going to carry these things forward. Arguably, you're really the reason that we're in the situation that we're in now. So many people from your generation were out on the Maidan. So many people from your generation are defining what it is that this country will or won't be. So it's on your shoulders. It's up to you. Please. Um, thank you, Alexander Poulos of Ukraine. Do you believe that uh, it's possible to end up all these terrible processes in the east of Ukraine using some peaceful and diplomatic methods, not uh, the armed forms and uh, uh, deaths of hundreds of people? So I didn't talk about what I did in Afghanistan, but uh, I worked as um, a member of a team in the headquarters that was doing reintegration and reconciliation. In other words, beginning the process of trying to create an avenue for fighters in the Taliban and other insurgent groups to leave the war without having to kill them. In other words, providing them the opportunity that if they were willing to respect the Afghan constitution, they could leave the fight and be given some form of uh, amnesty or protection from the crimes that they've committed. There is no more sensitive program than something like that. And really, this is something that we were working on, but we were supporting an Afghan minister who was actually the one creating this program. Uh, and this is a perfect example of why you don't want to get in front of your host country nation. Yeah, if we're dragging them along the, the road of reintegration, it's not going to be sustainable. Um, the battle for hearts and minds in Afghanistan when I was there the challenge for reintegration and indeed the solution for reintegration for bringing these fighters out of the fight was at the most local level. Most insurgents in Afghanistan operated within 20 kilometers of their home. So if you could figure out what the grievances of their community were, and oftentimes it was complaints that the Afghan government was corrupt, that uh, Afghan governors and district leaders were stealing from the people, et cetera. If you could figure those issues out, then the community would oftentimes be the connective tissue between fighter who might want to leave the fight for any number of reasons and uh, the Afghan government that was extending a hand saying, OK, if you want to come out of the fight, we can come up with a program to do it. Um, I don't work on these issues here. But I would say in any situation, any conflict termination strategy has to include this type of reintegration reconciliation mechanism. And I, as I said, I don't work on that here. I'm sure that there is a similar strategy within your government to deal with these issues. But I would argue that just as in Afghanistan, you know, we never pretended that our reintegration program itself was the solution. It was an accelerant. It was helping the overarching strategy, which was one of counterinsurgency, which had carrots and sticks, yeah? which had hard measures and soft measures. But I would agree with you that you have to have the soft measure. But I would add that you also need the hard measure. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of conflict. Good question. Yes. One more from the online audience. So, um, uh, speaking of the patrol police reform, how far, uh, how far up in the hierarchy does this change reach? As we may replace all of the patrol people, they will still be reporting to their superiors, and, the, and if those superiors are not the new blood, this change will not amount to much. Well, first I would say about the patrol police force, it is under Deputy Minister Zguladze, who reports to Minister Avakov. So, this particular structure reports all the way to the top. Um, there is a strategy in reform where you create a new institution or you create a new unit within an existing institution and you create this, let's say, perfect, you know, non-corrupt, efficient, um, highly trained unit and you bring it into the bureaucracy. And there are two things that can happen. One, this new unit can share all of its new ideas and new practices and force the bureaucracy 
to change to operate in a way that is better and that works with this new unit, or the new unit gets introduced into the bureaucracy and gets corrupted and influenced in a negative way by corrupt and other inefficient practices. Our hope is that this will follow the path uh, that I described first. In other words, that the patrol, as I've described before, is the chance to create momentum, but it's also the chance to create processes, guidelines, approaches to creating better structures throughout that ministry. And this is not my idea. I mean, this is the minister's plan. This is deputy minister's plan. This is what the reformers in the ministry want to see happen with this reform. Anything else? Please. I would like to just put it out in two minutes. We all know about the conversation about the United States military supplies and military support to Ukraine. And all this kind of thing is going through your department or, or military? No. Oh. Not my department. Uh, no. I, I mean, effectively, we do everything in between what the military does and what, you know, sort of USAID traditional development assistance does. Like so we don't work with, we with weapons. Yes. So yes, our assistance has also been non-lethal. In other words, providing armored vehicles that protects people's lives, enables the border guards to do their operations, but we have not provided weapons or any kind of lethal assistance, nor do we have plans to do so. That's it. Thank you all very much. Oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> sorry, we just keep receiving questions. But, um, Chris, what do you think about civil and political school project that, la that was launched by Georgian leaders? I wonder if that's a question from the civil and political school. Do you think, maybe? Actually, I gave a presentation to the civil and political school uh, last Friday, uh, believe it or not. Um, I think it's a great school. I was very impressed with the students there who are, you know, um, uh, young university students or graduates, but also, you know, more professional types, people who are interested in these issues. Uh, it seemed like a wonderful school. I was very impressed with it. Um, the founder of the school, uh, Khatia Dekonoidze, is a, an old friend of mine, so uh, I certainly think she's done a great job there. And I would encourage you all to check it out. Um, it's worth, yeah, worth investigating. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, do you cooperate here uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Mikhail Saakashvili? <laughs> and uh, of course, maybe with David Saakashvili and Georgi uh, Vashadze, yes, in terms of prosecutor uh, sector reform? Yes, not, not with uh, not President Saakashvili. I mean, uh, we don't work on issues that uh, mm -hmm that have intersected with him. Uh, but with the new Deputy Prosecutor General, Mr. Sakhar Alidze, yes, we are cooperating with him and supporting him. I did not know him when I was uh, a political officer there. He was Deputy Prosecutor General uh, at that time, but I, I didn't ever work with him. But, you know, as a technocrat, as I said before, you know, these people, they bring interesting experiences, both in terms of what they have accomplished, but also in terms of any mistakes to avoid this time around. Uh, and I, you know, I'm very happy to say that all of his reforms, and I know he had a very public uh, press conference last Friday where he and Prosecutor General Shokin, which is important, articulated the types of reforms that they want to implement. And they all sound very logical and reasonable to us. And if there's anything that we can do to help, we certainly will be providing assistance to those processes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know them? Uh, yeah. yeah? Uh, What's your impression? Uh, three years ago, I remember it was a meeting at the Georgian Embassy, and we discussed uh, um, the houses of justice yes. and reforms. And all this was quite nice presentation. So we were wow, well, wow, well, so inspired. It would be great to have such a system in Ukraine, but at that time it was, of course, not possible. So we just dreamed and <laughs> left the conversation. Okay, it's good that Georgia has, but what, what we will have. So yeah, I can remember thinking the same thing, actually. You know, in Georgia, they have these um, public service uh, houses where you can go and get, like, every public service done at the same window. 
I wish we had that in the United States, you know. I go and have to go to five or ten different uh, organizations in order to get, you know, driver's license here, passport there. And it was great to see Georgia where they've done it all in one place. It really was an interesting creative reform. Yeah, yeah. And it's so easily and it prevents, uh, prevents corruption. So there's a great system because if you have only 20 minutes for doing such operation, so if 25, something is on, but the corruption is held there. So right, right. Good system. I agree. And one more question sure. about uh, border guards um, uh, training in Afghanistan and in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Are there some similarities? Because as I know, in Afghanistan it's also very difficult to control the border, with Pakistan especially. And yes. Now we have a big, uh, and we always said a big border with Russia, so it's the same with the issue somehow. But, but the land landscape, of course, in Afghanistan is different. Yeah, the landscape is different, but with respect to the ongoing conflict uh, in the East, I think the fact that you don't have control over the eastern border is a major, major challenge for trying to contain and end that conflict uh, for all the reasons which are patently obvious to anybody looking at this issue. It was also a major challenge in Afghanistan. Trying to stem the flow of weapons and fighters across the border was a major challenge, uh, particularly, as you note, in the rugged mountainous terrain. Uh, you know, when you fly by helicopter across eastern Afghanistan, it's, actually, it's absolutely beautiful, the mountains and everything, but it makes a very difficult border to control. Good question. Please. Okay. How do you imagine the Korean future? How do I imagine Ukraine in the future? Yeah. I think I'm looking at Ukraine in the future, right? I mean, uh, I imagine all of you, you know, in government, making decisions. Uh, look, I, I'm very optimistic about the situation here. I know that it is very challenging. I'm sure that as citizens of Ukraine, you have very high expectations of what your government can deliver. You face... Uh, uh, existential conflict in the East. You face an internal existential conflict for reform against corruption. You face massive economic challenges. But at the same time, as I said before, you know, it's my interactions with people of your generation, my interactions with reformers in these ministries, seeing how hard people are willing to work for what they believe in. I would say that the, a major advantage you have is something to believe in. And that, as we discussed earlier with the question reflecting uh, moral justice and reflecting belief and emotion, is critical. Morale is critical. Believing that things can be done is the most important thing in accomplishing them. So uh, I hope that my optimistic view on these reforms uh, will be carried forth, and I'm confident that they will be. So I expect to see a lot of smiling faces in Ukraine in the future. Uh, jokes aside, I think, you know, you have real unlimited, almost unlimited potential in this country, given the size of your population, the education of your workforce, the fact that civil society in this country is so dynamic and so strong. You have a lot of really positive trends going in the right direction. Uh, and I hope that's what's going to help you overcome the challenges that you face today. Please. One more individual question. How do you see the future of Korea? Future of Crimea. Uh, well, I think the present for Crimea is very bleak. Uh, uh, the future, uh, look, Crimea belongs to Ukraine. Crimea is part of Ukraine, so I see Crimea in the future back in Ukraine. I'm not saying how far in the future, <laughs> but uh, I think that's where it belongs, and I think that's where it will return. Any other questions? No? Thank you all very much for your time. I really, oh, I'm sorry, what? One more? Let's hear it. I'll maybe the last one. All right. Um, Chris, the former and present law enforcement officials have substantial financial resources in various forms. Will something be done to curtain those resources? I would argue that um, tackling that high level corruption is something that is extremely important. And you see this government taking measures now against corrupt actors, both in the uh, 
uh, within the bureaucracies, but also in the political spheres. Uh, so I think dealing with them is very important. But really, in my view, transformational change comes from the ground up. So dealing, and if you look at other countries where these types of changes have happened, it's a combination of both. Yes, those actors need to be dealt with. There's no question about it. Um, but also transforming the level of corruption at the most basic, at the ground level, uh, is, is equally, if not more important, in providing for transformational change in any institution, in any structure. And I think the most fundamental demonstration of that in your recent history is what happened in the Maidan. And this was a ground up change that shook things to the very top. More work needs to be done on that issue. Um, and it's important. But it's the ground level changes that give me even more optimism about transformational change in Ukraine. All right, good. Thank you very much for your time and your patience. It was a real pleasure speaking with all of you.